I am delighted um, to introduce next Carla Kelsey, who is a distinguished poet, essayist, editor, and educator. She is professor of English and creative writing at Susquehanna University, and she is the editor of a forthcoming book with Yale University Press, which will present for the public two previously unpublished books by Mina Loy. Carla, we're thrilled to have you with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne and, and Amanda um, and Bowdoin College. And um, none of us can be um, exuberant enough in our thanks, I know, to, to Roger um, for all of the Mina Loy that he has given us um, and to Jennifer for her extraordinary work on the show. Um, and so it's just an honor and a great pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, today. Um, I've written something for you that I will read, um, and I do have images. Thank you, Amanda. So I'm uh, calling this Invention and Salvage, Celebrating Mina Loy. Strangeness is inevitable, shimmers with Mina Loy's brilliance, intelligence, irreverence, and craftsmanship. In celebration of her multimedia and multi-genre genius of salvage and invention, I've organized this talk about two of Loy's previously unpublished long-form works of prose, The Child and the Parent and Islands in the Air, around these twin topics, around salvage, around invention, Pairing my remarks with the novels, with images from the show and from her manuscripts. And then there's also a, a rogue image um, that we can discuss if you would like later. I have more questions about than answers. Salvage, part one. The Child and the Parent, which is one of the, the novels um, loosely defined, and Islands in the Air, belong to what Loy called her book or her novel a cycle of autobiographical manuscripts all unpublished in her lifetime that draw on her childhood, student days, and artistic literary life. Loy's thought to have written The Child and the Parent in Paris in the late 1920s and early 30s after selling her lamp shop and prior to immigrating to the US in 1936. Enigmatic and philosophical, the book begins with infancy and early childhood before branching off into a lyrical meditation on the repression of women. Islands in the Air, dated to the 40s and 50s, reshapes the initial passages from The Child and the Parent into the story of Loy's alter ego named Linda, and then follows Linda into her teenage years as she strives to become an artist, an independent young woman. Given these dates, we can imagine the two manuscripts unfolding within her second, in, within the second room of this exhibition. I'm not advancing, can you help me, Amanda? So we can imagine them unfolding within the second room of the exhibition, thank you, alongside the visual work Loy created at the time. So the blue paintings in the 30s and the constructions of, of the later period. Islands in the Air opens with a woman's arrival home to her apartment, astonished at its disarray. Although she tidied it that morning before leaving, care, a carelessly flung pair of shoes now directs the woman's gaze toward objects scattered across the floor, perhaps the untidy woman. <laughs> Tissues with their, quote, lipstick Corollas blossom among faded piles of ivory paper, half of one volume gone to the mice. The woman narrating this opening scene of Islands in the Air, we later learn her name is Linda, recognizes these, quote, ghosts of manuscripts written at odd wiles as part of the book she had once felt impelled to write. Compelled to resume her project, she'll salvage these pages and expand them into the novel that unfolds, offering, quote, a life for a life, my experience to yours for comparison. Loy titled this chapter Hurry and calls it an experimental introduction on the note you see here scrawled on the back of one of her manuscript pages. 
Its invention to consider life as an unfinished book anticipates Loy's focus on self-fashioning, as well as her refusal to confine herself to a single narrative. It also hints at the intimate connection between the two novels. The child and the parent is the very manuscript strewn across Linda's floor. As the experimental introduction indicates, the opening chapters of, the, of Islands in the Air takes part one of the child and the parent, which is built in two, two parts, as their foundation, reworking it into Linda's story. From the outset, the child and the parent is provocative, and it's easy to see why Loy returned to this material, an experience common to all but forgotten until reclaimed, the free state of infant consciousness not yet formed into an identity. Born of the continuous spiritual stuff of the cosmos, the infant doesn't initially distinguish between itself and the physical world. Unfortunately, the passage from infancy to childhood strips this oneness away and social values take its place. In chapter four, the narrator notes, quote, not realizing that my very survival depended on submitting to that psychic pressure that church and state and even the police force would see to it that I should, and that failing their protection, the economic system would throw me out of life itself if I tried to escape, I decided to ignore it." End quote. Of course, as Yale, as, as Loy's narrator well knows, she cannot ignore it, and the novel examines the internalization of these structures along with the creative spirit necessary to strive against them. A work of feminist lyric philosophy, the child is, and the parent is breathtaking, unique. Infused with the energy she describes, Loy's language in this novel is both abstract and sensuous. Sentences swell to paragraph length, then shift to the succinctness of cut glass. Her tone ranges from scathing, irreverent irony to crystalline lyricism, while her imagery is alternatingly beautiful and boldly grotesque. Long before 1960s feminism directed attention to the political in the personal, the child and the parent draws out the ways in which the most intimate issues of domestic life and female sexual pleasure are structural and systemic. Islands in the Air, the second novel, pursues a related journey toward freedom through Linda, Linda's feminist plot. Though its language is less abstract and its narrative more conventionally structured than the child and the parent. The components of Linda's childhood and adolescence mirror what we know of Loy's own early years, a rigid Victorian upbringing under the quote unquote care of a verbally abusive mother, the simultaneous reprieve and disappointment of a London art school at 15, a year of studying art in Munich, where she lodges with a nefarious baron and baroness. It's also tempting, exhilarating, to read Loy's early years as an artist through Linda. At an age prior to language, Linda creates one of her first artworks, an assemblage of found materials meant to create, quote, an exact reproduction of her entire concept of her baby sister. And here's a quote um, from this passage in the novel. I am putting the finishing touches to an exact reproduction of my entire concept of my baby sister, a feeding bottle I had somewhere seen steeped with its India rubber tube in a pan of water. So Linda's narrating this event that happens when she's almost pre-language, she's so young. Something disrupts the act of creation and then the door has shut on that audience to which a work of art owes half its existence, and I am all alone when to my cruel amazement in the palm of my outstretched hand, I find lying a queer abortion, a sharp needle. Is not one aspect of each life one alone with danger? The thread in its eye is wound round and round its middle like a little tough white belly. One of her first artworks. It's also tempting to read Linda um, through the art school that she goes to in London, where she finds life-saving inspiration in artists, like, uh, artists and writers like Dante Gabrielle Rossetti, condemned by Max Nordo as degenerate. In Linda's year in, as Linda's year in Munich draws to a close, she takes up a corncob pipe, 
ornamented with an albino fly, a performance of self that anticipates Dada and rejects traditional femininity. But more important than how Islands in the Air maps onto Loy's biography is her investigation of what it is to be in the world and how to salvage a creative life in an environment that might, in the words of Linda's mother, crush it. As Linda matures, even the objects that surround her threaten to constrict her. Corset busks, machine-made furniture, the bricks, brick box of her parents' house, its iron staircase figured as the backbone of a nervous system entirely deranged. In response, Loy crafts a narrator who's both passionately sentimental and coolly ironic, both wickedly satirical and endearingly sincere. Linda is allowed to hate her mother, violating a powerful taboo, and often infuses her narration with sardonic humor, which she has no problem turning on herself. Many readers will blush with recognition when Linda is shamed by her mother for developing a figure. Who among you will be surprised to learn that a visiting male art critic, quote, practically licked his chops over her drawing of a beautiful woman? Yet Loy's narrator discovers what many women never do. Telling her own story in her own way is a crucial act of salvage, of resistance. Part two. And in Part two, invention. A valentine that ticks inscribed with the phrase, my heart beats for you, and including a cheap watch. A device for washing the outside of windows from the inside of a room. A handsome bracelet that doubles as an ink blotter. Mainly dating from the 1940s when Loy was desperate for income, for the most part her inventions, as we know, were never manu manufactured. Not now known only through the proposals preserved in her papers, these ideas were generated during the time Loy is thought to have written Islands in the Air. And the three alphabet games she proposed to FAO Schwartz in August of 1940 particularly resonate with that novel. Loy's proposal, as we've all been able to see in the art gallery, includes a copy of her introductory letter, a hand-painted script demonstrating how to play the games, and diagrams of two letter sets. The game she called Build Your Own Alphabet consists of, quote, pieces with which to form letters, and the accompanying script demonstrates play between the child and the adult, as the child learns that, quote, all the letters are made of I and O and pieces of I and O. In playing with the toy, the child rearranges the pieces on the board, a process that, quote, grips the child's interest. In another design, the alphabet blocks open, each containing a small toy that corresponds with its letter. The block B, Loy explains, would harbor a small bird. The preferred version includes more than one toy for each letter, illustrating language's multiplicity. These games brilliantly foreground the material nature of language so prominent in Loy's writing practice, and which some of us in this room have written extensively about. Initiating a long tradition of critical attention to Loy's dazzling puns, neologisms, and use of multiple languages, as early as 1918, Ezra Pound points to Loy's work to exemplify logopoeia, or poetry that is akin to nothing but language, which is a dance of the intelligence among words and ideas and modification of ideas and characters. An avid worker of crossword puzzles, she often includes in her drafts word lists created via anagram, a form of wordplay based on multiple combinations of fixed elements. For instance, on the back of the last page of an early draft of the novel's The Bird Alights chapter, Loy Hand wrote a list of words that can be created from the word immediate, a word that appears in the beginning of the next chapter. On the front side of this draft, the type is peacock blue, and she ends with a concrete poem made by typing the word Loy in a triangular form that elegantly repeats her name both in the interior and along all three sides of the periphery. While the precise role such language games played in Loy's artistic process remains a matter of speculation, it's hardly a coincidence that she developed her alphabet games around the time she rearranged material from the child and the parent into Islands in the Air. 
Much like an anagram, Loy recombined elements of the earlier draft into the later draft. Furthermore, the novels reserve a special place for coming into written language, which offers entry into, quote, the composite brain of humanity. In contrast with her alphabet games, which emphasize the child's freedom, the child in both of Loy's novels is given a fat book of rhymed alphabets, a book that does not invite participation in the creation of knowledge. Instead, the child is meant to memorize and internalize its content. This comes to an acute point when learning that, quote, Z is for Xantip, Socrates' wife, who is defined by the alphabet book as being a great scold. Moreover, the narrator explains, this definition has the power of destiny. As the child and the parent unfolds, destiny manifests in the impoverished roles available to women, souring their potential. Islands in the Air funnels this fate through the determination of Linda's mother to extinguish her daughter's will, as well as through the misogynist social structures Linda encounters as she develops. Loy's alphabet games and incorporation of the alphabet book into her novels occur in the context of her larger interest in language's inherent, re inherently recombinant nature. She explores this across her work in many forms, including anagrammic grammatic play with her own name. In her poem, Lion's Jaws, she has the lines that you see here, Nima Lyo, alias Anam Yol, alias Imna Ali, secret service buffoon to the woman's cause. In another act of self-fashioning, Loy changed her birth name, as we know, from Loy with a W to Loy without a W in 1904, and regained her legal right to resume it after her divorce from Stephen Hoyce in 1917. She found significance in the closeness of her last name with Arthur Cravans, whose birth name was Fabian Avenarius Lloyd. Loy often signed official documents, including her letter proposing the alphabet games to FAO Schwartz, Mina Lloyd. This version of Loy's name contains, among other words, the name Linda. Applying the strategy of the anagram to her own name, Loy suggests that a self, like a word, might be taken apart and put back together in multiple configurations. Although there's freedom in this model of self-making, there's also formidable constraint. Just as the letters of the alphabet are confined to what the pieces of I and the pieces of O can create, the self understood in this way is delimited by the possibilities it's given at birth. Throughout the child and the parent and islands in the air, Loy brings awareness to these limits, foregrounding the stifling gender expectations into which female children are born. She also draws attention to women's infliction of these restrictions on each other. Bird-like ladies who live in an aviary in chapter seven of The Child and the Parent, quote, nibble and gobble and trammel the fallen woman. In Islands in the Air, the Baroness plots to compromise Linda in return for profit. Moreover, a figure in both novels called The Voice, capital V, painfully reveals the corrosive process of internalization that limits female potential from within. A combination of the protagonist's mother and cultural expectation, the voice is born when a domino flies out of the child's hand and breaks the window. Acceptable girls, as we know, don't break things, exert physical force, or let their bodies lose control. The voice sweeps through the child and uses the accident as proof that she harbors evil inside her. From that very moment forward, she's hounded by the voice, often in the form of a, of a stream of abusive disciplining dialogue from her mother. By the end of Islands in the Air, the voice has been internalized. Quote, the record of the voice playing on my mind periodically accumulated such confusion, it exceeded my capacity. However, all is not lost. Counterbalancing the voice's monolithic weight, Loy incorporated a multitude of other voices into her novels. Her protagonists, family, friends, and acquaintances contribute lines of dialogue. Colloquial turns of phrase, often ironically employed, are frequently set off from the surrounding language with scare quotes. Quotations from the Bible, Dante, Gabriel, Rossetti, Shakespeare, popular music, and cabaret songs enter the narrative and then exit. Non-English words, puns, and non-traditional spelling increase vocabulary beyond what is monolingual and correct. 
Some of these voices support the limitations of the voice. Others reject, challenge, or operate entirely otherwise. In any case, their inclusion insists on an array of languages, of vehicles of expression far in excess of the plot points of any individual's life. The only known recording, as we know, of Loy's voice is an interview Paul Blackburn and Robert Bastias conducted with her in Aspen in August 1965, the year before her death. And if you haven't yet taken the time to listen to um, excerpts of this recording, you must run up to the gallery after these events and do so. At the age of 82, she retains her British accent and sharp wit interspersing stories from her life with recordings of poems from the 1958 Lunar Baedeker and Timetables, her second published book of poetry in the last volume released during her lifetime. Nearly halfway through the interview, she reads from Love Songs, which is a version of the long poem Songs to Johannes that scandalized readers with its fragmentary form and erotic content when its first four sections appeared in the inaugural issue of Others Magazine in 1915. Loy interrupts her reading to comment throughout, that's clever, and, but that's why they said I was so frightfully immoral, and wasn't I funny? It's really delightful. Between two of the poem's most daring passages, she takes a longer pause to speak of her home life as a child, where, quote, this woman was shrieking and driving us cracked with her bad temper. She then describes leaving home to study art in an art school in Munich. There she lived, quote, in a house with a baroness who was always trying to get me into trouble so she wouldn't have to account for the money my people sent. There is great pleasure in listening to Loy recount plot points from The Child and the Parent and Islands in the Air in the midst of her most provocative poem. Loy's voice, fragile yet strong over the hiss of the tape recorder, carries a message to the Lindas of the past, present, and future. Do not allow yourself to be defined by the strictures of your time. Thank you. I am now delighted to offer a very brief introduction for our third speaker of the second session. I'm delighted to introduce Sarah Krangel, who is Professor of Modernism and the Avant-Garde at the University of Sussex, where she researches and teaches literature and culture from 1850 onward. She is a prolific scholar, and we are absolutely delighted that she will soon be bringing out a two-volume study of Mina Loy's work with the body. Sarah, thank you so much for being with us. We're delighted to have you. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's a, such a privilege and such a pleasure to be here, and I'm grateful in absolutely every direction that I've managed to see this exhibition. Um, I'm going to be speaking today about this two-volume work that Anne has just mentioned, which is called An Anatomy of Mina Loy. And my premise in these two books, so I'm, I'm going to be giving you an excerpt from the book in essence. Um, my premise overall is that Loy's pivotal relationship to the body is inextricable from her esoteric understanding of the human soul. So the first volume of this anatomy is titled Nethered Regions, and it deals with the lower half of the body. So it has chapters devoted to Loy's presentation of toes, feet, genitals, belly, and womb. And the second volume is called Elevated Realms, and it deals with the second half of the upper half of the body. And it uh, addresses the heart, the back, the nerves, and the eyes, and I mean all three eyes, including the third eye. Um, which Loy is quite fascinated with later in her life. So volume one uncovers Loy's feminist reworking of traditional satire. And this, in this regard, I think she's, she's is, is the first sort of stage of her feminist visionariness. Um, Loy undoes satiric tradition um, in a way that's really forward looking. So typically satire attacks an enemy who is considered loathsome or repulsive. Um, Aware that repulsion it can 
contains rather attraction, Loy's satire inverts tradition, attacking to generate intimacy between herself and her enemies. She's, she's not attacking to create distance, which is what satire is generally expected to do. She attacks to bring her enemies closer. Along the way, she tries to level ideological and higher, hierarchies and hierarchy, hierarchies of identity. The second volume uncovers Loy's esoteric leanings, and the reason there's two books is because she has so many esoteric leanings. I was quite surprised by this, um, and so it just didn't stop. And, and there's more to be discovered, much more than what I've, what I've written. But she's interested in everything from Platonic philosophy to 18th century mesmerism to 20th century theosophy to psychosynthesis and fourth dimensionality. Just the, the, the influences run rife through her work. What I argue in this second volume is that Loy's esotericism coheres in a theory of eros, the love that is the counter to her satiric aggression, right? So she attacks, but she also generates love. The thanatus and eros are the two, the binary that kind of holds her work together. And Loy's eros involves a bodily sex-positive feminism and what she labels the lust of the humane. And this is the indicative quote where I get this phrase, the lust of the humane from. These quotes are pretty heavy going, so stay with me. As there is an amorous orgasm, writes Loy, which is the juncture of our sensibility with cosmic sentience, so there is a spiritual orgasm, the mystic's admittance to cosmic radiance, an intellectual orgasm, a mingling with the intelligential ether, an aesthetic orgasm on our impact with any of the myriad facets of cosmic beauty, so there is an orgasm of loving compassion, the lust of the humane. So Loy's eros is desirous, it's sexual, but it's also familial, it's also spiritual, it's also artistic. Lust of and for the humane, I think at her best is Loy's driving principle. Just look at communal caught, you can see the lust of the humane is just everywhere in that, in that piece. But as this is a celebration of Loy's visual art today, it is Loy's thinking on achieving successful aesthetic orgasms, as it were, that is going to be my focus. Right? What is it that she's talking about? This was not the direction I thought I was going to take when I started writing the paper, I should say. Um, we all know that Loy is a writer and an artist. And she was also one of the most photographed women in modernism, right? Linda Kinahan writes really well about this. Loy was accustomed to the role of portrait sitter or muse, often for her male contemporaries. Now, in 1973, the male gaze was very famously theorized as follows, and many of you will be familiar with this quotation. In a world ordered by sexual imbalance, pleasure in looking has been split between active male and passive female. The determining male gaze projects its fantasy onto the female figure, which is styled accordingly. In their traditional exhibitionist role, women are simultaneously looked at and displayed with their appearance coded for strong visual and erotic impact so that they can be said to connote to be looked atness. This is a very famous essay, of course, by Laura Mulvey. But what I want to argue today is that Mina Loy actually developed a theory of the male gaze 50 years before Laura Mulvey did. And this is Loy's version of the same. The expression of the most popular beauty, writes Loy, is a still of some evanescent reaction associated with the orgasm. Her eyes are always turning up for the spasmodic oncome so that men may plunge a preliminary gaze into this seeming promise that their senses have come upon something to share. Now, Loy is aware of the predatoriness in this process, right? She's not dismissive of that, but she nevertheless promotes these representations as a plausibly rapturous association between art and sexuality. This is what she writes. The sensory scale of the erotic symphony must in some way accord with the unknown laws of proportion in beauty, as if perfection in art induces in the intellect a consummation comparable to that with which the harmonies of a human face crown some aesthetic craving in the genitals. Right? So she's trying to bring sexual desire together with laws of beauty and proportion. 
This, I think, is Loy formulating the aesthetic orgasm for my first quotation. On the one hand, she's asking why it is that women must be reduced to the plungible, right? But on the other, she wonders if there is something valuable in this artistic ecstasy, something salvageable from it. So Loy realizes that fantasies of masculine autonomy and potency encourage male artists to conjure up images of women that reflect their own desires. A male artist, Loy writes, can catch an eye in the full of its lusterless pretense and polish it with his lubricity until it dazzles him in the very radiance that he induces. As Loy uncovers this theory, she references Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve, and she says, that man is the model prototype to which woman has had to conform, leaving open the question of where woman begins and where woman ends, right? So this is a work written in the 1930s, but we're hearing echoes of the feminist manifesto from 1914. Where, what is woman? How do we define this? For Loy, woman's very beginning was of an initial secondariness that left her the whole gamut of development, except for the creative impetus or starting point. Loy's an artist, she's a muse, and she's absolutely galled by this absence of female originality, this defining loss of a thing that women never got to possess in the first place. And this loss, I argue, propels Loy's turn toward the muse or the model as a potential site of women's creative power. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, <clears throat> as Loy is coming into her own, artists' models were perceived as sentient tools. Their thinking, their feeling, their ability to inspire were considered irrelevant. Like prostitutes, modernist models were paid more than their working class peers. It was a lucrative, a lucrative job. Like prostitutes, female models were assumed to be sexually active with the males who paid them for their time. By contrast, Mina Loy insists on the muse's untapped creativity, positing that the muse might be an artist in her own right. I say this because Loy wrote a series of short stories, one novel, a ballad, and three Romana Clef that address the artist's model. And curiously, all of these works remained unpublished in her lifetime. She was really fascinated with the notion of the artist's model. Loy's muses aspire to originality, but they tend to fail, ironically, due to the lack of a good model to emulate. They can't, they can't model themselves as artists because there's nobody to copy. Um, why is Loy interested in the artist model so much? I think there's two sort of contextual narratives that I draw out in my own thinking. This is the first one. Loy, as we all know, attended art schools in London, Munich, and Paris before 1910. And this is the period in the late sort of 19th century, beginning of the 20th, that is now considered the height of the modeling profession, this kind of um, professionalization of artist modeling. In turn, as this is a happening, contemporary periodicals equated artist models with fallen women. There was a kind of mo a moral panic about the artist model in this period. And Loy writes in, in um, Esau Penfold, one of her autobiographical works, that when she misbehaved as a girl, her parents used to threaten to disown her, meaning that she might be subjected to, and I'm quoting Loy, the lowest employments. If she's disowned by her parents, she might have to be, she writes, a dishwasher or, still more desperately, an artist's model. Right? <laughs> Um, at the same time as Loy is being told, you might have to be an artist model, the lowest of the low, she's also, of course, being mocked by her parents for wanting to be an artist, which is something that she's discovering for herself at this time. The second contextual narrative about why Loy is so interested in the muse, I think, is that decadence and symbolism are in full swing at the same time as Loy is coming into her, kind of her adulthood. These movements co-opted the feminine. They espoused self-martyrdom as a value. They ecstatically explored failure, incompletion, and the irrational. From these avant-garde movements, decadence and symbolism emerged a very now, a now very familiar term, which is the accursed poet, the accursed poet. The prototype of the accursed poet is Charles Baudelaire, an addict and outcast who laments how his originality is misunderstood by the masses, even as he is revered by his poetic peers and rightly anticipates that he will influence future art. Alert to the decadent legacy, Loy, I believe, formulates a female counter to the poet maudit, to the accursed poet, what I call the accursed muse. 
The accursed muse is as knowingly abject and neglected as the accursed poet, but her anonymity is perpetual, her reception is negligible, and her legacy is risible. This is a type, the accursed muse, and she has a typical biographical narrative that contains the following components. Firstly, the accursed muse is a beautiful girl who has an upbringing marked by subjugation and poverty. Secondly, by chance, she meets an artist on the cusp of recognition. Thirdly, she falls hopelessly in love with said artist and proves willing to become his muse in spite of the vexed public reception of this role. Fourthly, she dies early and very tragically. That's the accursed muse, that's her story. And it's a story that's applied to Manet's Olympia, Victorine Mirand, a real life woman who was said to die tragically and addicted, but did not actually, had a very successful career, and was an artist in her own right. And you can see its reversal, the accursed muse, or the attempt to reverse it in Andy Warhol's Edie Sedgwick, for instance, the kind of ce the celebrity artist model, um, although she also does die early and tragically, as it turns out. A curse muses that Loy knew uh, or knew about include Elizabeth Siddle, the partner to Dante Gabriel Rossetti, with who was a major influence, as have we've already heard today on Loy. She, another curse muse she knew personally was Gwen John, the sister to Augustus and the partner to Rodin and his muse. And of course, Kiki of Montparnasse or Alice Prynne, the partner to Man Ray, whose portrait by Loy is of course included in this exhibition. All of these women were artists as well as models, a truth long overshadowed by a reception that romanticized or derided them as models. Okay, I'm gonna take a bit of an intellectual lurch here, but just stay with me. This is a quote from a wonderful book by Wendy Steiner about the artist's model. <clears throat> she says, the model engages in a self-sacrifice in which she births a creation that displaces her. Hence, womb and matrix are archetypes of feminine modeling, molds that generate copies. The artist's model is equatable with the woman's womb. What I wanted to say is that this, which is written in 2010, is some, this idea is absolutely integral to Loy's own writing about the artist's muse. Loy makes this parallel between women's anatomy and posing through all of her work about the artist's muse. She defines them by their torsos, by their guts, and by their wombs. She satirically deploys the abdomen, the site of female reproductivity, to interrogate the cliché that the male genius births masterpieces whilst women birth children. Right? So she's using this knowingly, using the reproductive zone as a way of challenging suppositions about women in art. Implicitly, Loy argues that maybe because of their wombs, women may prove to be the better artists. <clears throat> and this motif arises in Loy's writings about herself as an aspirant artist. And these are quotes drawn from um, the child, and, uh, or sorry, Esau Penfold, another um, autobiographical, te autobiographical text. When Loy was at art school, she was often asked to model by her male peers <clears throat> and to, men who then were no longer interested in her when she said she had to be chaperoned, which is interesting. In her own first attempt to draw a live model, Loy recalls being overwhelmed by a strange pain that functioned according to some cerebration of its own in the abdomen, right? So she's in a room, there's a model in front of her, she's suddenly overcome by this pain in her stomach. At first, Loy succumbs to this pain in her generative anatomy. She recognizes that it is driven by shame about creativity instilled by her family and society. Her family has told her a woman should not be creative. Self-conscious, Loy writes that she recalls longing to take a plunge to be done with it once and for all. But she cannot plunge a preliminary gaze. She cannot attain the aesthetic orgasm at this moment. She can't quite bring herself to be the artist that just draws the model. Telling this story, Loy foregrounds her innocence and her virginity. This comes up in the story. She conflates sexual and aesthetic ignorance by foregrounding the abdomen, the gut, and the womb. So just to repeat, for Loy, the reproductive and the consuming body is inextricable from artistic generativity. This Loy theme defines her story, which is called The Stomach, that she writes in 1921, where an artist muse is renowned for a pelvic pose that evokes what Loy calls the momentary, momentous projection of the stomach in Spanish dances such as La Tarantella. 
Loy's protagonist in this story it, um, called The Stomach is a woman named Virginia Causeway. And she performs what Loy calls her Hispano abdominal ceremony for a sculptor and his admirers for a period of 25 years. The sculptor is never named in the story. Loy calls him the master. And Causeway is his muse, that's clear. But Causeway rejects the master's offer of marriage. And, but nevertheless, she finds herself defined by him, hammered into a posture into which she was to become fixed for life. Virginia's pose is not all defining. Loy's narrative refuses to reduce Virginia to the prop of an artist. Performing her pose, Causeway gains an increasing aesthetic autonomy as the story goes on. And this is what Loy writes. Under the arc of the handshake with a brief undulation of the hip and the adjustment of a forefinger, the stomach outswung to its noble attitude, as if enticing aesthetic culture into her womb to be reborn for her audience. Causeway's stomach in this passage becomes the source and site of future art. And by the end of the story, Causeway's stomach is an arbiter of aesthetics. Notes in Loy's archive at Yale suggest that Causeway is a reading of the American painter John Singer Sargent's portrait of the wealthy Boston socialite Isabella Stewart Gardner. There's now a museum named after her in Boston, courtesy of her fortune. I argue that Causeway in the story The Stomach is a composite of three paintings by Sargent that caused scandals when they were first exhibited. Namely, El Haleo, which was a Romany dance. This painting was perceived to be perversely sexual. Henry James in particular took against it. He thought it was shocking. Um, secondly, Madame Pierre Guatreau, now known as Madame X. This painting also was considered too sexual. Um, it didn't sell at the Paris Salon. And lastly, indeed, Isabella Stewart Gardner, <clears throat> who was assumed to be having an affair with Sargent. So this painting did not have a very long shelf life as a result. Knowing what we now know about Sargent's sexuality, the possibility of an affair seems quite unlikely. But nevertheless, that was the, the story that, that circulated after this painting came out. All three of these paintings emphasize the female torso. Sargent is famous for painting bourgeois women and professional beauties. <clears throat> Lois, the stomach, her story, the stomach, lends Sargent's infamous pelvically defined muses a kind of artistic aspiration, a kind of control as well. <clears throat> Mina Loy believed that bodily organs possessed their own consciousness, and maybe after this talk we can talk about vaginal clairvoyance, which is something that Loy liked to talk about herself. Um, in an autobiographical chapter tellingly entitled The Outraged Room, Loy argues that the uterus can access the cosmos through pleasure, and then internalize that infinite feeling within the finite receptacle of the self. Through the uterus we attain an infinite ecstasy, she thinks. But for Loy, even if the womb is not literally fertilized, its genius never ceases to ideate the concussion of ecstasy, which is the sole content of its consciousness. As in Loy's story, the stomach, this womb that she's describing, can ideate. It imagines, it conceives, it forms ideas. It is not just a womb, but a womb brain. And that's Loy's phrase, a womb brain. In the outraged room, Loy subverts the 19th century obsession with hysteria. She links mental well-being rather than pathology with an attainable womb happiness. Along the way, Loy describes how women is perceived as at the mercy of her natural body whilst being sub subjected continually to impossible expectations of artifice. Loy says women are always painted to look as much like a bonbon as possible, to look like a candy, right? A fancy wrapped candy. Females know artifice then as they know generativity. For Loy, women's brains and wombs have been tossed onto the discard area of unconsummated things, even as the uterus aspires to have its dream confirmed. A dream, I think, in her writing about the muse that is aesthetic. It's a dream of aesthetic orgasm. Patient to a fault, Loy writes, the womb can be roused from its apathy. And she warns us, it can locate a torrential indignation, one that can outlast attempts at its negation, the curses and accursedness by which it's defined. 
I'm gonna conclude now, and I've, I've called this talk Feminist Visionary, and I'm gonna try and gesture toward why I think, some of the ways in which I think Loy is a feminist visionary. Loy, of course, knows that men are equated with the intellect while women are defined as bodies. Women are defined as bodies to the point that uh, one feminist has coined the phrase somatophobia. Women have a fear of the body because they're so tired and exhausted by being reduced to the body. But what I'm trying to argue here is that Loy's feminism works with the body. She questions the smooth, closed, classical body. She resists bodily surface by focusing on organs and innards. But as such, Loy precedes a feminist return to corporeality by six or seven decades. Recent research affirms the gut as a cognitive organ, one that ruminates, feels, and develops habits, right? Not roving, not hysterical, but in possession of a mind of its own. As Elizabeth Wilson argues in Gut Feminism, a book that asks how feminists might reintegrate biology into their understanding that culture overpoweringly constructs femininity. For Wilson, ingestion, digestion, peristalsis, they're all significant parts of the psychic landscape and in turn are ways of reading female desire, aggression, and masochism. Like Loy, what, what I think Elizabeth Wilson is trying to do is to give the female body a voice, right? To hear how it withstands pressures and hostilities, to attend to its complexities, to its reproductive organs. Loy reclaims eros and she reclaims spiritual ecstasy, intimate ecstasy, artistic ecstasy. All of this are now, these sorts of thinking are now prominent themes in post-Fordist thought. Evid you can see this evidence from activist author Audre Lorde's reclamation of the erotic to, for instance, queer theorist Jose Munoz's celebration of ecstasy as a critique of the dominant order. Right? Loy foresees some of this, I think. Furthermore, Loy's writing on the accursed muse foresees second wave feminist art that blurs the line between muse and artist, right? The artist that becomes her own muse, for instance, in the work of Cindy Sherman, Carolee Schneeman, and Adrian Piper, among countless other artists. An English woman whose father was a migrant Jew, her mother working class, Mina Loy, feminist artist, knew what we continue to relearn that Western humanism is productively challenged by the knowledge that bodies offer and develops only by recognizing diverse bodies, their coordinates, their interactions, and their irrationalities. Thanks very much, everybody. Thank you so much, Sarah and Carla. And actually, Sarah, I might invite you to linger up here if you don't mind. Sorry, I know. I, and actually, Carla, I don't know if you might be willing to um, come forward. And hopefully, we can bring in Anne as well. What a fascinating group of papers. Um, I thought that they played off of one another. Um, why don't you all come over here and then Anne can see you too, if that makes sense. Um, I think Anne's vision may be <laughs> determined by the lens of this yeah. laptop. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you want to sit down? I think it might, or we could pull up chairs. Would that be more comfortable? Stand. I, I actually like standing, <laughs> it's okay. Um, but what an amazing group of talks. I thought that they played off of one another. Here, I'll stand over here. I thought that they played off of one another um, so remarkably, beautifully. And I just would love to, again, um, once again, I have my own questions, but it would be a pleasure to just open up the floor, um, if I could. Um, are there questions? Yes, Sebastian. Oh, and Sebastian, we're going to just ask you to speak into the mic only because that will make it easier for Anne sure. to participate. Yeah, so I wanted to ask you, Sarah, about, I like your concept of curse muse a lot. 
I want to ask you the relationship maybe with avant-garde cinema at the time. I was thinking maybe of uh, Carl Dreyer's uh, Joan of Arc, for example, where the case of Joan of Arc is very important too, and she's considered like a muse in the Christian sense, let's say. And if uh, Mia Loy has any relationship with that, if you thought of that connection, because you're also talking about the case, right, the case imposed by a lot of the uh, male writers, let's say, even in the quotes from, uh, that we read before from William Carlos Williams, the way he portrays her as being clean, poetry is his own poetics as well, he's portraying his own poetics there, so. I don't know if you can talk a little bit or you know any of the relation with her or with other filmmakers and other filmmakers. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm really glad you raised the thing about the William Carlos Williams because I was just talking about that with Nancy where jo Loy's daughter is saying, oh, my mother was a bit slovenly, right? William Carlos Williams is saying, every word she writes is so clear and so pure. And there's something there of a very deeply entrenched vanguard desire for a pure language that kind of transcends the semantics of understanding, I think, at some level. But the purity, you know, I was saying to Nancy, a man describing a woman as pure is always deeply un uncomfortable. Um, but nevertheless, um, can you, I don't know enough about Loy's relationship to avant-garde cinema. It's not something I'm particularly cognizant of, but what, what, is, what is your understanding, like this description that you're giving of the, the Joan of Arc gaze may, maybe might be worth kind of lingering over as a, as a, as a description of the accursed muse. Yeah, I, I was thinking that in a, in a way she's taking some of the ideas because the, the essay you're quoting from with the womb and as a reaction of like, let's say an unconscious reaction to, to, to how she's being portrayed or, or seen, it's, it's from the 30s, right? So this movie's from the 28th and in, in, that, in that movie the female body, although it's Joan of Arc and there's all the symbology for Christian thing, is at the center, right? And it's a very specific shot. Most of the famous shots are all of her hair, mm -hmm. right? And her tears, basically. And she's looking in a lateral way, right? Like if her gaze is not direct to the audience, she's being scrutinized by this Inquisition committee, basically. And there is some kind of like, I, I feel some kind of connection yeah. because it's a, it's a body reaction yeah. through a gaze that's not direct towards the camera, although she's being addressed directly in a way. It's just kind of like, I don't know, resisting that kind of appropriation. Yeah. So that, and, and it's very close in years to what she was doing. And I imagine that she was connected to the avant-garde circles, yeah. definitely as was to Champ as yeah. well. So that's why it just it came out. Well, that's a really fascinating connection. In fact, in, in my, my chapter about this, this particular topic, I, I have located an image um, that Rossetti drew of Elizabeth Siddle, which is a really fabulous and I think little discussed image of her. And she sat in a chair um, and she's giving just the most venomous gaze I have ever seen <laughs> and directly at him. And he draws her in this, this posture where you feel that she's sort of tucked up in an armchair in a sort of very cozy way, but the gaze is just extraordinarily direct and accusatory. It's an accusatory gaze. Um, part of this, the story of the stomach is complicated by the fact that at the end of it, Virginia Causeway, the protagonist, uh, the eye of her mother protrudes from her womb at the end of it. So there's, a, there's this whole other layer of complication that I couldn't get into, but certainly this idea that how do we rethink the male gaze and what would the female gaze be is, is an outstanding question I think that, that Loy is assuredly trying to get at in that story and elsewhere. So thank you for that link, yeah. So sort of um, something to think about and maybe already written about it, is that the, the photographs that are credited to Stephen Hoyce of Mina, it seems that she actually is that active controlling muse who is controlling the gaze and how those, she's very empowered in those images. She's not being innocently photographed. It seems that she's the director in terms of how she enrolls herself as a model in those photographs. And it seems to me that, that as a, there's a direct connection to what you're speaking about. I, I, I'm so interested in that description in so many ways. I, the, the footage that Julian Levy, which is also in the exhibition, there's just this absolutely divinely wonderful moment where Loy is looking into the camera at sort of three quarters of the way through that two minute um, 
ex excerpt, uh, where you see her positioning herself, right? She's really thinking about how she looks in front of the camera. And you can see this is a woman who has been in control of her image before. And then there's a really funny nanosecond where her eyebrows go up and you just can see that there's a kind of satirical, isn't it funny that I'm doing this again? Um, and how, how alert and astute she is about her own positioning. But th those hoys, pictures, the one where she's turned to the back and we can see her nude figure, I have always felt really uncomfortable with that image. And I don't feel like she's in control of that image in the same way. So it's sort of interesting that it's when she's turned away that the control is lost. Her shoulders are hunched up so high. There's something, it's not the nudity that makes me uncomfortable. It's, there's something I feel that's uneasy about her body in that particular image. But the other three, I, I see what you mean about her astounding understanding of positioning herself. And posture is another thing I write a great deal about in these books, that she's very good at, the, at posing and, and the posturing body is a real fascination for her too. Thanks. Well, wouldn't you say, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yes. Yes, yeah. Yes, yeah. Uh, I'm just thinking that the, the, that comment, that last comment with her, her new body turned away, I should imagine that the reason this is an uncomfortable thing to look at is that we can't see her face, mm -hmm. which is always registering some kind of, of even contradictory uh, expression toward what's happening, right? She's, she's interpreting what's happening to her when you can see her. So it's very uncomfortable that we don't see what she looks like when she's having this photograph taken. And also you wonder how he set that up. You know, I mean, what what is it that happened in their in their you know a, agreement where he set up or take a photograph of you from the back, you know, like turned away? I find that very disturbing as an idea. Although she's so beautiful from the back, you can understand why you might want to do that. <laughs> I completely agree. I think, though, even without, I, I think the body language of it. There's something sort of. Con constrained um, and uncomfortable. And so it's, it's in even not quite just about the face. And I agree with you completely. And what was the preamble to that happening? I mean, that was not a comfortable relationship. You know, what was it? Yeah, there's, she's not at ease from the, from the neck and the shoulders down, I think, as well. But yeah. The, in her art overall, right, she goes on to just be depicting the face and the hands as her primary subjects. To mm -hmm. They're like, her body was a problem. Body was a problem. Right? What is that? There's a, a very definitive decision in terms of her work, right? As she goes on, that they are, you know, she writes about the face being the way we control our self-representation. But in her artwork, she focuses all the way to the end on faces and hands. It's kind of an interesting... Uh, I mean, she writes really beautifully about, as I've just said, about the, the womb and the torso and the legs and the feet. All, all of the body parts, I think, do get really amply covered. You're right. I think that what Anne's just said is really interesting. With her face, she can have that kind of satirical control in some ways over the image. And that, I think, is really important to her. I agree with that. Yeah. Well, she's also, by doing that, she's controlling the interpretation, right? She knows that if people can see how she's thinking about it, change how they're thinking about it. It's really, yeah. And that reminds me at the, the end of Islands in the Air, after Linda figures out that the Baron and Baroness um, are sort of extracting money from her parents in order, they're, they're telling her parents that they're helping her buy outfits for fancy parties, but they're really keeping money. And they're putting ads in the newspaper for gentlemen to come have dinner with their English miss. Um, so they're, they're turning a profit from um, Linda and she finds this out and her um, response to it is to then get the key from the um, Baron and Baroness. So she no longer has, you know, they're, they're demoted to landlords and she adopts a corncob pipe that she goes around Munich with this corncob pipe. And so it, it refigures her face. It makes her no longer this eligible English miss walking around Munich. It prefigures Dada. And it's a complete um, moment of agency. Nearly simultaneously, she um, portrays the Virgin Mary in the art school's play. Um, and as she's nursing the baby Jesus um, doll during a rehearsal, the lamp lashed to her waist bursts into flames, 
All of the um, other ladies in the art academy scatter, and if not for a quote unquote Jana Tess who saves her, um, she would have um, been immolated. So it's just, it's a, it's a condemnation. And with the corncob pipe, she becomes friends with the avant-garde of Munich, um, of many Russians and Germans, and she learns Bohemia. Um, so it's really interesting, this conversation of the face and the way that it does um, act as a unit of agency. And absolutely, Anna, if we could see her face in that, um, in that background shot, um, it's beautiful to wonder into how she might have take an agency over the, the image, yeah. Are there other questions? I might ask one more if I could. Um, one of the themes that I saw um, moving through each one of your presentations was this idea um, of, and, and you sort of set us off on this track of the beautiful and the unbeautiful. And in a way, Jennifer, I think this language of control and lack of control may somehow figure into this. And um, I mean, it's interesting to think about um, where revelation fits too, um, particularly, for example, with this imagery of the womb or the heart. And I can't help but think about a surreal scene in this regard. But Carla, this leads me actually to the opening of your paper um, when you talked a little bit about islands in the air. And Nancy, I keep thinking of this woman, of this image of the untidy woman. It's so powerful. But this moment in which, um, uh, is it Linda? Is Linda the narrator in, yeah, Islands in the Air? When she m comes in to find her apartment seemingly in disarray. And what I was curious about is the degree to which disarray or untidiness or the unbeautiful um, may be a form of revelation. Um, whereas we tend to think of that imagery as being disruptive and undesirable. I was curious from each of your standpoints the degree to which Loy perhaps um, inverts those common values and reclaims them. And maybe this also has something to do with um, women, femininity, Sarah, and the degree to which women may um, grapple more with this problem of lack of control over the body. So that's a big question, but really having to do with beauty and unbeauty, um, tidiness, lack of tidiness, control, and lack of control. And I'd just be interested in each of your reflections on that because it was so prominent to me in each of your talks. It's so brilliant to ask that question about, because it refers so quickly to domesticity, right? I mean, the, the needy house is the, the, the constant understanding of, of um, uh, feminine capability of, of uh, doing her job, right? If the house is neat. Um, but, it, but it also reminded me, Anne, of, of just that phrase in the poem that I, um, that I read in the beginning, um, the dusk of chaos and, and the way in which she was so interested in um, arriving at a place of uh, initial creation, you know, like the dusk of chaos is when there isn't anything yet. Uh, and it's actually related in a bizarre way to the conversation about the womb. I mean, it's, it's sort of a similar uh, understanding of uh, of, a, of, an, of an original place of creation before there's anything else, right? That's where chaos was. So this is really a great question. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. And I think um, post-creation, there's some... Um, there's great, I don't want to say hope or promise, but there's, there's creative catalyst in trash. So when she arrives home and her manuscripts scattered around with her lipstick tissues, um, a roach crosses her path and she real, she's like, you know, for a long time I haven't killed anything sentient and so I'm not going to kill this roach. And she imagines into the roach and she sees the neighbor's laundry um, hanging out the window. So she gets, keeps getting distracted by these, um, you know, these disruptive images, but they're catalysts, and it makes me think of the, um, the wasteland to which women are com com you know, consigned in the outraged womb, which you spoke so gorgeously about. Um, so this terrain vague that um, society just um, casts women into this wasteland and, and treats them as trash. 
Um, and so in some ways she's entering, you know, post-creation she's entering this landscape um, that's obviously not optimal, but she finds great creativity in, in it, I think. Yeah, do, do we have time for me to answer? Yeah, that's okay. Um, there's a great quote in Incel that my students always land on, which is where she talks to Incel, the, the male, the recognized male artist, and Mrs. Jones is this figure who is trying to become the recognized, and she describes it in a way that aligns really beautifully with what you've just said, Anne, about reaching into the primordial to try and find where women's creativity begins, right? And of course, the, the womb is the kind of ultimate site of the, pri the primordial. But I think this, in fact, one of the things that I love most about Loy, um, is her fabulous ability to be at one with the abject. And, um, and this, so this goes back, there's many things I don't like about Julia Kristeva, but Powers of Horror is just such a terrific book. And she's so right about the equation of the feminine and the abject. And again, and this might be another way in which Loy is a feminist visionary. Loy sees that women are abjectified over and over and over again. And she just runs right into it, right? She's like, okay, you think I'm this, I'm just gonna be that and I'm gonna inhabit it, I'm going to explore it, I'm going to make it the substance of my art, and I'm going to be unafraid of the abject. See what you do with that, right? And so many avant-garde movements where, you know, I'm, I'm men going, ah, oh, I'm quite interested in the abject. You know, Dada was very interested in abjection as well. But Loy was like, I know you think I am this, I am this, and I'm still unafraid to run right into it and own it completely. And the fearlessness of that, I think, is just one of the most terrific things about who she is as an artist. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. Well, I think that is a beautiful note on which to conclude um, our second session. Thank you so much, Sarah, Carla, Anne, for a very, very thought-provoking discussion. Thank you, everyone, for your excellent observations. <laughs>